For generations, Ventura has thrived on the dedication and determination of extraordinary individuals, cultures, and families that guided and inspired our community. Family members from these pioneering families celebrate their remarkable histories by sharing captivating stories and personal memories. These are Ventura Legacies. Hello, welcome to Ventura Legacies. Today we're in a, for a real treat. We have three folks that will really tell you the roots of this community that we all live in. Rather than me introducing you, why don't you each introduce yourselves. Tell me who you are and how you fit into the equation. Okay. Uh, my name, I'm going to give you my legal name. There's a little history with my, what I go by. My legal name is Marie Antoinette Baez Chacon oh. Mena. Um, when I was a baby, my aunt was trying to get me to giggle. And she would say, oh, what a cute little pumpkin. And pumpkin went to punky. So a lot of my friends and family know me as punky. So a lot of people, when I introduce myself, I actually say punky instead of Marie Antoinette. In the working field, I was Tony. So I'm a lady with many names. <laughs> and so, so can I use punky or you do I have the right punky. to do that? It seems like a special treat. It is very special because it's connected to tortilla flats. OK. Yeah. Introduce yourself. My name is uh, Carlos Chapman, and I was uh, born and raised here in Ventura, a native of Ventura. And I'm Jim Elwell Martinez. I uh, come into this world, I think it was on a Sunday afternoon, about 431, by Dr. Weed, and um, right over to Tortilla Flats, the old barrio, now the junction to Los San, San Francisco, and Ojai sits right on top of our house. But my family, and Carlos also, and like I was explaining here to Marie, that uh, our families come through here with the Portola Expedition in 1769, and then with Colonel Lanza in 1776, and with Governor Felipe de Neve to colonize the Santa Barbara Channel, beginning with the city of Los Angeles, Ventura, and then Santa Barbara. And after that, the family just moved out. Uh, my family come from Santa Barbara, like his did, and, down in Los Angeles and uh, went into the Ohio and from the Ohio to Ventura. And here we are. Wow. Well, so where do you want to start? Help, help me out. I mean, you've, you've already got us running a little bit. <coughs> Fill in some of the gaps. Where, where you explain the family, how they got here, and uh, what, what occurred. What was, it, what was it like? Put it that way. What was it like at that time? Do you know? When the expeditions come through here, it was like being the Russians. If you were a bad guy, you were sent to Siberia. Okay. There was nothing here. All the food had to be transported by ship. And sometimes the products never got here because they were either sunk or they had to fight the winds coming up from New Spain at that time to pay for the soldiers and the priests and everybody that didn't get here. So basically when all the soldiers and the religious part came here with Father Sarah, they came with nothing. So they had to depend on New Spain to bring these products and stuff. And in the meantime, they were getting all their missions going and their vineyards and stuff, but it took a long time to get started. You know, so in the meantime, I mean, uh, Father Sarah was, uh, wanted to get his missions going, you know, and he was sort of, having a problem there with the military and the government at the time because they were there for because of the arm of the king to establish the jurisdiction of all California, especially at San Diego and then up here at uh, Monterey, San Francisco, and then finally at Santa Barbara, the last presidio that was founded. But and then after the years rolled by, when things started to roll in, the crops grew, everything's got bigger, the missions got to be pretty well off and they were sustaining the people around. We had the local natives working with us, you know, and along with the priests and stuff. And of course, they were getting paid too. And a lot of people saying they weren't, but they were because I've seen the records, you know. And, um, and then something happened about 1834, something like that, uh, the Secretation of the Missions, you know, Mexico. You know, they had a war with Spain and the transition of power from all the four presidios in California changed in 1822. And uh, Santa Barbara was the last one. And it was there that, the, that everything started to fall, go down and go down. And the 
Native people were having a hard time at the mission sustaining themselves and stuff. And I guess the priests and everybody knew that the time was coming when Spain had to give up everything, which was really started out to be for the Indians, you know, and the native peoples, or should I say. And, but it didn't work out like that, because when Mexico come along, for the 26 years that they had it, up until February the 2nd, 1848, with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, they did nothing for California. Nothing, you know. They sold the missions. The, our, our little native groups, you know, that are sort of sort of mad at the Spanish and, <clears throat> and Spain, they were put out in the street like we have our homeless people today. Really? You know, that's what happened. It came fast. So they turned into alcoholism and, you know, everything else, the bad things, and things just didn't go right for them, you know. But our families, the descendants, and like Charles, the, uh, Carlos, the Chapmans and stuff like that, we spread out Carlos' family. Uh, was down at <coughs> San Gabriel, I think it was, with the grist mills, and they made a way for themselves, and we made it happen. You know, we made it happen up until today, you know, and we all have a nice, fine lineage that we all come from, you know, but sure, that's the way it happened in those days, yeah. Wow. It was hard. When I first started out, it was hard until the missions started growing their own food, and then, of course, the soldiers that were living in the cities, they had their own gardens and stuff like that, so, yeah. How far back does your family come, <coughs> Carlos? Well, uh, the first chap that came to California was uh, 1818. He actually came from uh, uh, Massachusetts, and uh, we think it was Epswich where he was born. And uh, for some reason or another, he got on a ship to come around to uh, <clears throat> I don't know to see the world or not, but anyway, he came around the Horn, stopped in the Sandwich <coughs> Islands, and there, there was a Frenchman by the name of Bouchard who was sailing for Argentina, and they were strictly against the Spanish regime at that time, and he was looking for people to man some ships to come to California and do some sacking of the Spanish uh, properties around California. Uh, so he got shanghaied by Bouchard and put in the service and I think he was in second command on one of the ships. I think there was three ships. And uh, in the process, uh, other people that were coming, going to sail to California from the Sandwich Islands had heard that the Bouchard was getting ready to come to California. Well, these people got ahead of him and came and warned all the uh, presidios up and down the coast. And uh, so they were kind of prepared for Bouchard and the pirates to show up. And the first place they came to in California was Monterey. Mm -hmm. And they raided that and sacked it, destroyed it. And uh, I think in the process he was captured, Joseph Chapman, but later on they had released him. So he was back with Bouchard they decided, well, we're going to go down the coast. So they ended up going to uh, Refugio Beach where um, Jose Francisco Ortega had a ranch. And they knew that he had a lot of property, a lot of stuff there. And uh, they were prepared for the fires to come there. But they, uh, they went on, on shore and they did, they did plunder and sack and everybody had, at the, uh, the ranch had gone inland to get away from them, and they just left a handful of uh, soldiers around. And uh, in the process of uh, them coming ashore, I think uh, one of the uh, small boats overturned, and Joseph and another guy were thrown in the water, and they were captured. And uh, the other fellow was a, uh, a black man, uh, Fisher, I think his last name was. But anyway. Uh, they spared his life, they captured him, and uh, he was uh, uh, given over to a, a, a person by the name of Lugo to watch over him while they had imprisoned him. He was uh, left in, in his hands. Well, in the process of, uh, of, of that, uh, there was a young lady named Guadalupe Ortega and her father was Vincent, Vincente Ortega, and she kind of took a liking to Joseph as, 
as long as they had him as a prisoner. And then they found out he, he was a very handy man doing a lot of things. Before that, he did get married to Guadalupe at uh, San Inez Mission. And he was baptized here in Ventura at the old mission. And they had several children. I think Guadalupe was uh, one of the uh, uh, siblings that lasted for a long period of time. He was impressed in building a uh, grist mill, a uh, fully mill at the San Inez Mission. And it was the first fully mill that was ever built English style. And they're still in existence at uh, San Inez right now. And uh, they have uh, restored a lot of it. And they are, are planning on making a state park out of it. Uh, then the Padres down in San Gabriel found out about Joseph Chapman building a grist mill and they, their mills down there were falling apart. So they asked him to go down to do, build a mill down there for them. Well, he did build a mill and it was across the street from the San Gabriel Mission. Uh, it's not in existence anymore. Um, he also uh, built a first water dam that was ever built in California and it sits in the Pasadena area and it sits on a uh, sunny, uh, sunny Slope Water Company property and it's one of the oldest uh, water companies in that area. And the uh, dam is still in existence. It was built by him and with the help of the uh, Shumash Indians there. And uh, the only reason I found out about it was that uh, a, a friend of mine that's the manager of the place had asked his brother, do you know of anybody, any Chapmans living in Ventura that might be related to Joseph Chapman? And uh, he, he told me about his brother and, and he told him, he said, well, I haven't come down. I got a lot of information on the Chapman family. So that's how I found out about the dam. Uh, just recently, uh, a couple years ago, they uh, did an archeological dig of the uh, gristmill that was what's left of it across the street from the San Gabriel Mission and they came up with a lot of stuff and they invited me to go down and see the digs and this and that. They did have a celebration last September after the digs. They wanted to tell the, the, the dignitaries, everybody in San Gabriel come to this uh, ceremony that they were gonna have and they wanted the Chapmans and the Shumash people, anybody to come and we had a big, big party about that. Cool. So. Your family. Well, <coughs> excuse me. My my family. It's I would say it's more colorful in that they came to um, the United States from Mexico. I'm guessing around 1912, 1913. Uh, my great grandparents came in a covered wagon, and I just I try to imagine in my mind, you know, how many days it took to get here, the dust, the wheel, probably falling off, you know, and having eight children you know, on their wagon, it had to have been pretty hard, you know, but their destination was to come to Ventura. I have no idea why they came to Ventura. I'm so glad that they did, they chose Ventura. I know my great-grandfather loved the ocean, and he did a lot of fishing and catching lobster, and he actually dove for abalone, and I actually have some of the abalone shells that my, gra my great-grandmother passed down to my grandmother, and now I have them. So I love that, yeah. And my grandmother was married here in Ventura. I think it was in like in 1915, they got married. Later on, she had her children, which one of them was my, my mother. Of the children that my grandmother had, my mother is the only child that was born in Oakland, California. The rest of them are all born in Ventura. Okay. And the reason being is that um, my grandmother had, my great grandmother had her sons, my great uncles, they lived up north, they had migrated up north to work in the, in the fields, the orchards. And so every uh, uh, season they would travel up to Oakland, Hayward, that area. And so my, my grandmother was pregnant thinking that she would make it back home, but she had my mother in Oakland, California. She had her there, but they lived here all her life, so. And so, why Ventura? I guess, I mean, you gave some of the, the roots of that. I mean, the, 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 the mission and all of that. But so that's how your family ended up here. And you were saying that this years goes all the way back to, to, to the missionary times, right? Mm -hmm. 
and and why stay? I mean, why not migrate out? And what what, what were the families doing as we're up? We were up to the the mission period. What what occurred after that? How did they integrate into the community? Maybe everybody stayed around here because uh, when they first founded California, the order was it came from Spain. When Senor Garvez, the minister of the Indies, that was in Mexico, uh, he, uh, he was in charge of some expeditions, two by land, two by sea. And the order was from Spain that they would found San, the mission San Diego Alcalá, which they did, Father Serra. And then they were going to go on to Monterrey, the port of Monterrey, because they figured, they hadn't seen, seen San Francisco yet, the Bay of San Francisco. They figured that's where it'd be a good place to put a buffer zone in case the Russians came down from Alaska, okay? But they wanted a mission in between and a township. The distance between San Diego and Monterey is Ventura. That's what they started out for. That was supposed to be mission number uh, before San Gabriel, 1770. It was founded 13 years later. And I think because of that, um, Everything grew out of that, went to Santa Barbara, you know, and then out to, to Fresno, Bakersfield, Los Angeles, and San Gabriel. And, but it was sort of like the hub. And today, that's the way I feel. Mm -hmm. I said, this is where we're supposed to come and stay, you know. So I went for a few miles to, San, to Santa Barbara and stuff. But uh, gosh, yeah, mm -hmm. right, that's what I feel. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes 100% sense. And. Um, and so walk me through your, your descendants, talk <coughs> who your father and grandfather were and what they did in the community. And answer the question, why is it called Tortilla Flats? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> well, Tortilla Flats, <clears throat> my understanding, got its name uh, from the movie Tortilla Flat uh, with Spencer Tracy. It was from John Steinbeck's book. Some of the people from it wasn't called Tortilla Flats at the time, but I'll say the barrio, went to see this movie at the Ventura Theater. And when they saw the movie, they related with the movie because it was filmed in a small ocean town similar to Ventura with similar problems and they could relate to it. So when they went back home, they realized this is our Tortilla Flats. So Tortilla Flats is plural for us and it was not with the movie. Why, I don't know, but that's how it stuck. That's the story I know. I don't know about my cohorts here. That's the legend, huh? <laughs> well, I knew about uh, Tortilla Flats when I was a very youngster, and uh, I did have a few people that were related to me living in that area. Uh, my grandfather, uh, Joseph Chapman, had a home on Front Street in Figueroa, right where the murals are right now for Tortilla Flats. He lived right there, and then I had another cousin Caroline Bustos Barone that lived on Brook Street. I knew quite a, the people, a lot of people that lived in that area and I associated, associated with them. I, my family and I uh, lived on North Garden Street, which is off of Main Street, right where Vons is now, mm -hmm. right behind that, uh, we lived there. Uh, <coughs> right there where they have uh, built those uh, uh, new apartments called the Cannery. Mm -hmm. There used to be a chili factory there called, uh, it was owned by uh, Ramirez and Farad Chili Company. And it was probably the first uh, operational uh, uh, manufacturing or business in Ventura. And uh, we actually lived across the street from there. And we, that's where we grew up. Uh, my mom worked there at that factory. And uh, when, what her job was, uh, she was to de-stem de chilies, uh, and uh, they had these tables chuck full of chilies, and uh, they would put these uh, sacks of chilies on the table, and they weighed about 300 some odd pounds, and they, a big pile of uh, chilies on top. And what her job was to get the chilies, take the stems off, and they had boxes on the ground. This is for the chilies, this is for the stems. And uh, she tried to knock them off within an hour. She was pretty fast. And that's a lot of chilies to be doing. To do and a whole bag in an hour? Yeah, the, the bags were 300 and some pounds amount of pounds. Of you know, big, big gunny sacks. I got pictures of it. And uh, she got paid a cent and a half a pound at a that cent time. A cent and a half a pound. 
And uh, I had a lot of uh, friends that worked there. Uh, we had uh, the, the Durans working there, uh, the Molinas working there, um, just a lot of, a lot of uh, friends and relatives that worked there for that company. Were the chilies grown locally? No, they were all brought in. They were all dry chilies. Oh, I see. Uh, there was a California chili, and then there was another chili called the Mexican chili, and uh, they put them together and cook them. They did everything right there. They canned, they canned all the, uh, all the chili sauce there, and made the chili beans. They still have the label. The company's gone now, and they destroyed the building. And the city should have. Uh, took pictures before they destroyed that building because it was a historical landmark to me it was. Mm -hmm. And nothing was ever said in the paper about it. So it's gone and uh, I had a lot of uh, memories of that place, uh, you know, going there after school, helping my mom do chilies. And the other families that were there, you know, they had uh, kids of my age and uh, some of the older fellows there were into uh, boxing and stuff like that and they used to get the gloves on us in there <laughs> and we used to spar around. Uh, we had a great time there. Uh, the boss didn't quite like us being <laughs> playing there but uh, he was pretty tolerant. Very cool. So what's Tortilla Flats to you? Well to highlight what he said about uh, Carlos, my friend said about the, the city not taking pictures of the building, reminds me of what happened at St. Mary's Cemetery in the 60s. I was overseas in Vietnam when I got the news they bulldozed that place at midnight. All the headstones and stuff went over to Hall Canyon in the gully. Yeah, and then everybody was notified later on. I have a lot of family there. Yeah, it's a dog park now. I think we all do. Yeah, we all do have yeah, family do. there, yeah. I do, yeah. Jim yeah. Does. This is the Memorial Park up on? On yes. the crest there at, on, on Main Street, yeah. yeah. Now, it, Memorial now it's a dog park. Yeah, but. Uh, Yes, that's what they did, you know, and I was overseas uh, during the war when that happened. I, was really, and I couldn't do nothing about it because I was 10,000 miles away, you know. And, uh, but that's the way that happened in those days, you know. Ventura has had a good thing about them, about hiding their history or getting rid of it, you know. Not like Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara, they got some good historical, like the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation. They cover mm -hmm. a lot of things. Just like the grist mill he was talking about. It is a state park up at San Inez, you know, and it's because of these people, you know, and down at San Gabriel also, but uh, Ventura's sort of shadowy on that stuff, you know. As for the Tortilla Flats, how it got a name, nobody ever know. Nobody will ever know, you know, whose kitchen it was. Uh, could have been Antonia Barrios down on Mita Street while she was making tortillas for her husband and stuff early in the 30s in the morning and stuff like that. But uh, I'd like to shoot back about 240 years ago again uh, with the history. When the Portola expedition came through here, okay, when it was sent from, by Spain, there was a Sergeant Ortega, later lieutenant and commander of uh, the Presidio of San, uh, Santa Barbara when it was founded. But it was his job, he was a scoutmaster, okay, and he had three people. He'd go ahead of the expedition and, and lay out the campsites, you know, uh, all the way up from where they left from Mexico and with Spain, you know, all the way up to Monterey. So they camped because I have the diary, you know, and several diaries and Palou's works, uh, uh, the Father Palou, you know, he states it too, that when they stopped in Ventura, they, uh, they rested there, they come out on, uh, by where the Olivas Adobe is now, come down the coast, okay, and they camped. And um, the next day, because usually when they'd, they'd uh, pick up the journey again, the priest would say mass early in the morning, you know, and this was Father Crespi. So he says, he states here on the 18th of August, okay, it was a Tuesday, I think it was, early in the morning, that um, they gave mass and then they crossed the river, the San Buenaventura. So that means that they were camped on the east side. Mm -hmm. Now on the east side, it's changed its course over the years, okay? But I lived down in that Tortilla Flats, that's where I was born <clears throat> and raised. The Bustos, Jess and Caroline Barone's house, was on River Street and where Brook Street River. met. Yeah, so they were about a thousand yards probably from where these old-time campers—I mean, these soldiers—bivouacked over a couple of hundred years ago. You know, 
So to the tortilla thing, okay, I'll fast forward now. Um, this um, name, uh, nobody knows where it started. I think I said that already, but anyway, these soldiers, when they came through here, their provisions were beans and chickpeas, dried meat or jerky, okay, they called it, called it carne seca, and they had flour, and they had a griddle and copper pots, okay? So what did they do with the flour? They made tortillas. That's what they did, mm -hmm. besides, you know, carrying their gear on, you know, but they made tortillas at every stop and every meal. So, like I said, where the name come from, uh, nobody knows, but I fix, uh, fix it, the name tortilla, that they were cooking them on the spot <laughs> all the way up California. They had to. That's all they had, and that's the, the flour they brought was for tortillas only because they didn't know how to make an upside-down cake, or they didn't even have uh, a number to do it with, you know? <laughs> So that's why, that's my view. Yeah, I think that's a good one. I, I, I will, you know. Yeah, all. I, I, it, it, it's interesting because you know when I asked the question, I thought, well, everybody knows the answer. Now I don't feel so stupid because. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> and it's the same for the boundary. <coughs> you know, where was Tortilla Flats? Mm -hmm. And depending on who you ask, you will get a different answer. But I, yeah, okay, because I assume, I always assume it's that, like that, well, where the mural is, that, that, that particular area under the bridge and all that, that would be there, but you're saying it might scale north and south of that? I, for me, yeah, it, it, it does, because in my, from, my, from my understanding, it was from River Street over to maybe Garden, the, when we're speaking the heart of Tortilla Flats, mm -hmm. Garden and Olive to Main Street where they had the Montanza, the Hobson, yeah, Hobson. Hobson's Slaughterhouse was there, which is now Patagonia. Right. So that area was the heart from Maine going all the way to the railroad tracks by the fairgrounds. Gotcha. So it was just a small area, and it was a very low-income area, but it was a very colorful neighborhood in that it was very close-knit, and people took advantage of the river. People did go and, you know, they knew some of the river rats, some of the guys that would go and fish and hunt and, you know, you would go out and have a picnic and, you know, and spend the whole day, you know, get up and go fishing, go clam digging. So it was very, it was a lot of nature out there at the time, ducks and quails and, Mud hens and Frogs. you know pheasants. Is this all part of your childhood? Oh yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, know, I used to live down that river bottom. Yeah, we made our slingshots down there. Yeah. You know, on Brook Street or any one of those streets down there. Let me draw you what it looked like. You know, it uh, asphalt in those days wasn't like it is today. It was different. Okay, the mixture was little rocks, big rocks, and everything like that. You know. When the sun would get hot, that street would get real mushy, you know, with black tar and stuff like that. You'd track it into the house or something which Grandma didn't like or anything like that. But there was no curbs and gutters, no sidewalk. I mean, the end of the street, it just went off into the dirt, and it was just grass, you know, wild grass and mud clods and everything like that. Then the neighbors, which was, they had usually big yards, you know, would go from that ending with a fence and maybe some four by four posts with maybe some chicken wire or something like that, or in some cases some bobbed wire, you know, and maybe the garden right there. And they always had a big vat with a drain down off the roof where they catch the rain water, you know, and, uh, and the street was like this, real lumpy, you know. And like I said, after when it gets heated up during the day in the cars, they would make it a lot more lumpy and stuff, you know. But the Tortilla Flats at that period of time, the real part was uh, where the Southern Pacific Spur left off the main track and shot to Ojai. Anything west of that was actually the Tortilla Flats. Now, now everybody's, you know, uh, you know, say they're from Tortilla Flats and this and that, and it's been expanded because in those days, a lot of people lived down there that were from the Tortilla Flats and a lot have died. 
but uh, and a lot of people today knew people that lived there, and they jammed around and you know partied around with them and stuff. And they lived on the other side, you know, down on the other side of the tracks, maybe four or five blocks away. But it was all considered part of the Tortilla Flats, like it is today with our club, you know. But yeah, those uh, it was fun in those days, you know. I mean, uh, in the grass, the wild grass, especially down by Willoughby's Dairy, you know, where it ran adjacent with the with the um, uh, what did I want to say, River Street, and then the big levee that they built in 38 because of the big floods, you know. The grass would just lay over. It's something like you see in Maryland. Oh. You know, that green, green emerald grass like that, you know, the cows, that's why they were so chubby. You know, they had something good to eat, you know. But yeah, those were the days, yeah. I remember going down there and uh, doing a, getting on little rafts that we build, little rafts, and go out to the mouth of the river before it dumps into the ocean and going out there rapping and having lots of fun. Right across uh, the way on the uh, west side was a place called Hobo Jungle. And all the hobos used to, at that time, gather at that place. And that was quite an interesting place. They had cypress trees all through that whole area. And that's where the monarchs used to come and take their rest on all these trees. You know, they could migrate from Mexico, and what a, what a beautiful thing. Oh. And then also, uh, during the war, they had a, um, uh, a cannon outpost there at the Hobo Jungle. And uh, I think you can see where they had the rails that's still in existence there. I remember all that. And at that time, the Ventura River was a working river. No, no, no dam at that time. There was a lot of water coming from the Ojai Valley area, you know, drained down in through, and of course all the steelhead, steelhead. at that time would migrate up, up the river and, and lay their eggs. And we had a lot of people, a lot of youngsters get their limits on steelhead all the time. It was a great place to fish. Sounds like a great place to grow up in that regard. It yeah, now it's all dried up and they right. had no place to go. Well, then also, I mean, we're jumping ahead, but obviously the freeway and that whole development basically kind of destroyed this, yeah. the whole thing, right? Yeah. When did that occur? 55, I think, 56, when they started bulldozing and everything. You know, in those days, we didn't have cameras. Not like you do today, you got a cell phone and you could snap anything. And I think the going thing, if you had one, was a brownie camera, mm -hmm. you know? You put the film in it and zzz, 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 mm -hmm. you know? And I think the neighbors would lend us ours or we'd lend it to them and they'd use it for a day or so, you know. But out there, there are still some pictures of when the construction was going down there. I think Vincent Diaz had a lot of pictures where they actually filmed the, or took pictures of the bulldozing and it went down there, you know. But uh, I remember, oh yeah, I remember down on our street there, on the corner of the Brook Street and Olive, this cat, I think it was D8 or something, started at one corner. Now, a lot of those homes, all of those houses, were standing on pillars, you know. I think they were two or three feet off the ground, four by fours, you know. They stood off the ground. And that reason for that was before they built the levee with the dam, the water used to flood and take every clean out your underneath your house. But I seen a cat, oh, a big D8, start at one end of the block and just go down all the way, all the way from that corner to the other corner on Brook Street and just take everything down. I mean, usually those houses were so old, they just moved and collapsed, you know, imploded by themselves, you know, and the big cat went over and smashed a lot of it up, you know. But it was easy, it was an easy job to take it all down, and that's, and that's what happened in those years. How did they sell it? I mean, did they sell it? Did, did you know this was happening? I mean, obviously there were people in the houses when they knocked them down, but I'm saying, how did they sell this to the community? What, what, was, the, what was the big vision? Imminent domain. Imminent domain. You sell it or you're going to get moved out anyway. And I think my grandfather, Bill Elwell, at 252 Brook Street, he had a beautiful house. Yeah, they, uh, I think they gave him about six grand or something like that. I'm not really sure, but it was in that bracket. Yeah. Well, imminent domain. Mm -hmm. It's like Trump does today. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I'm yeah. Some of those houses were constructed as a single wall construction, you know, only one by, one, one by 12s. That's, that'd be your wall. And I don't know the place that we lived in, uh, it set off on the ground and it had four by fours as a foundation holding up the house. And uh, I remember uh, them having newspapers 
covering up the uh, the boards, you know, so you couldn't see back and forth and for insulation and stuff. I remember crawling underneath there when I was a kid, getting down, get all dirty, <laughs> going underneath the houses. That was a lot of fun. Uh, going back uh, when I was a youngster, uh, I had an uncle that worked uh, for a mentor police department, and uh, his name was uh, Camilo Salcedo, and they called him Sally. And uh, he introduced me to the Police Boys Club. At that time, they had a Police Boys Club. And the location of that was on May West Main Street where the old adobe sits. That used to be the Police Boys Club. And we used to gather there. They used to have rifles, and like soldiers, we'd go through all the commands and this and that. Sometimes we'd go down the river and we'd call the sham battles. We'd have our sham battles, or you guys against us and this and that. And that was a lot of fun. And there was, I got, that's where I got to meet a lot of the, the younger men there, you know, and older boys that were there. And uh, a lot of them went in the service after they got out of there um, during World War, after World War II, the Korean War, and, and so forth. But uh, I had a lot of fun there with the Police Boys Club. Now they call it the Boys and Girls Club. One of you used the term barrio. Was it all Hispanic? Was it, was it a cross-section of, of cultures? Or what, what was the population like in, in, at, in Tortilla Flats, the time you're talking about? I don't know. What did you say about maybe 300? Not more than a thousand. There was different ethnicities. Well, I mean, yeah, a, lot, a lot of people. Early from, on, I know they had the, um, the Portuguese and Asians, Chinese. And there was a few Afro-Americans living there as well. Uh, and of course, at that time, a lot of our Shumash people did not want to admit or um, hi they wanted to hide that they were Native uh, at the time. And correct me if I'm wrong. You're right. But uh, so we really didn't know how many Shumash lived in the area. But we later on, as years went you know, by, we found out that, yeah, indeed, they lived there. I mean, and it's only obvious, I mean, they should have been there. Right. Um, and then little by little, I, I remember as a young girl seeing a lot of Asians, but then they just disappeared. And I did, I, for years, didn't understand why. And then, of course, later on in school, I learned about the camps and the encampments, and because of the war, they were, you know, taken away. Whether or not they were born here, you know, it was, it was something sad to realize um, as an adult working with a, a very nice gentleman who was um, Asian, born here, but he was traumatized because him and his family were taken away. So, um, yeah, it's, it's hard to say, you know, how many Hispanics, how many Spaniards, you know. I know a lot of the people in Tortilla Flats came from Mexico. Uh, and it's interesting, I was sharing with Jim that I'm gathering stories to uh, publish a book, and a lot of them came from uh, very close uh, areas of the state of Michoacan in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them came during the revolution um, to, you know, because they were afraid. They needed to get away and, and be safe. Uh, at that time, uh, the soldiers were, you know, ransacking their homes, taking their food, and actually kidnapping their, their, their daughters. So um, there's one story that um, she was, um, the, the daughter was sent for by uh, a rancher, uh, um, the Canets. The Canets actually loaned this family some money to bring her to Ventura um, to keep her safe, and her father had built a fake wall, a hollow wall. So the girls from the village, when they knew that the soldiers were coming, they would all run to their home and hide in this wall. And then one day, there was a lot of commotion going on in the home. And um, the, the lieutenant outside of the home heard all the ruckus and he went into the home. And he realized, he noticed that there was a statue of the Sacred Heart and a candle burning. Well, the father was a very devout Catholic and uh, worshipped the statue. And so because of that statue and the candle, he ordered the soldiers out and told them to leave that house alone. After that incident, the father sent his daughter to Ventura. <laughs> nice yeah. So that's what they were facing. 
amazing mm -hmm. story. Yeah. Um, so you're saying there was like somewhere maybe a thousand people in the in the area? I would say, yeah, I would say. Because what it was what a time pretty, frame are we talking about? Oh, we're probably, gosh, I come along in the 40s, uh, and so probably earlier than that, in the 30s, you know. I mean, that, it, the country's always been patriotic, but even though those people who lived down the Tortilla Flats, they were more patriotic. I can remember Grandma's house, they had this mantle, okay? And they had a nice scarf on it and a picture of Franklin Roosevelt, you know, draped with a scarf like that. And then especially, you know, because they kept, they watched his, uh, well, they didn't have TV then. So they had that old Hoffman, I mean, you turn it on, had big tubes in it like that, and it would go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and then the voice would start to come on, you know. But they would sit there and listen to his fireside chats, okay, all the time. They were real patriotic, you know, and then it hurt my grandma a lot when uh, Roosevelt died in 45 in Warm Springs, Georgia, you know. But uh, yeah, that was pretty much sad on that time, you know. Gosh, uh, another thing I remember too was the old triple four nine, the daylight. We used to make two runs from San Francisco to Los Angeles, Union Station. It was the one that big, beautiful streamliner steamer mm -hmm. with the orange fenders and the white walls. <laughs> yeah, we, it'd make a run, I think at six o'clock, coming back headed for San Francisco and early in the morning about six, it was headed south Union Station. All us kids down on River Street, Caroline kids, you know, they would all, uh, her, her daughters, you know, Miss Bustos that he was talking about, we'd all get it out there and all the river rats, a young generation, and we put pennies or whatever on the track so we could <laughs> get them smashed by the train and then later on pull them over and make Indian hair, uh, arrowheads with them. So and then it was off to the river bottom where it wasn't so far away. You know? But that old daylight, that steamer, you could hear it all the way from the Rincon. It was <coughs> you could hear it, the steam, the whistle, you know, as it was making the turn there. Beautiful sight. Not like the Amtrak today. The Amtrak pushes everything backwards. Yeah. Yeah, it does. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. That's, that's certainly true. <clears throat> well, I mean, these stories are such a part of the rich history, not just the town, but obviously your families. I mean, are you, how do you pass these on to your family? How do you share these with, your, with, with the, the generations now? How do, they, how do they learn? How do they know? It well, could happen. At, oh, you go ahead, Carlos. Well, I'm into genealogy, yeah. so I have a lot of information that I have gathered and accumulated. So this is one way I'm going to be able to pass it on to my, my, my children and grandkids. But um, it seems to me that a lot of them aren't really interested at this period of time. But I think when they get older and retire from their jobs, maybe they will start to wonder, where do we come from? Well, Grandpa has all this information and they'll have it but they're missing out meeting these people face to face. Right. And I'd love to do that, to visit face to face with older, older descendants. I'd love to do that. Great. So that's how I keep in touch. And that's terrific. I'm involved with quite a few things as of late with the Tortilla Flats Legacy. Presently, I'm with the commander of the soldiers of the Presidio Santa Barbara. We do reenactment from the Puerto Lanans and that expedition. You know, we have, we put together all our stuff, cannons, muskets, everything, because when the Mexican period come through here, they burned everything, you know, because it was Spanish, you know. So 170 some years, every, the Presidio in Santa Barbara was dormant, you know. So we pretty much had to go out to Mexico City and to Spain, Sevilla and Madrid to look up the old records of how they even dressed, you know. So along the way, you know, we've, um, been to schools and tell about our projects, you know what we do, we take tables, you know, lay out our gear, you know, and um, been as far north as what, uh, Washington State, far south as Loreto, Baja California mm -hmm. for the Tritons, Tricentennial, uh, east to Washington DC to march in the, the Revolutionary Parade because I have family that fought the American Revolution too, the Elwells. And, uh, but along the way too, Every chance I get, and like today on Saturdays, you could find me at two o'clock in front of the old mission, okay? 
I sit there and I talk with tourists. I don't have to, but it's just what I like to do. And I talk with the fourth graders because that's great curriculum. You study missions, you know. Mm -hmm. And that kind of history goes to another thing. And the barrios, what we're just talking about today, just about everything, we share it. I don't hoard anything. I give it all away, you know, to help somebody else that wants to know about it, you know. I write things and pass it out and mail it out and text it out and whatever. You know, I just love history and telling everybody about it, you know. That's great. I just love that, you know. I wanted to be uh, into history. That I wanted to go to school and major in it, you know. But And I was doing pretty good in high school, but my father got killed in 1959 in an auto accident. So that ended that, and I had to go to work. And right after that was the war in Vietnam. But I kept up with my studies and stuff, you know. And today, I'm not bragging or anything, but I could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with somebody who's got a PhD. I'm sure you can. I, 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 when you first started talking, I mean, you were, you, you were a scholar. And, oh, thank you, sir. And, and, and with passion, and that's, and, yes. and that's so critical. It isn't just academic. It's, right. it's, I mean, it, it's heart and soul to you, which, which comes all of you. Yes, there, it's and, all of us. And then you're writing a book. Tell yeah. me about the book. I'm trying to get yeah. stories that we have, um, we've interviewed over the years families that have lived in Intertia Flats. And so I was asked uh, last year, and it actually started in 2013, <clears throat> when we had a beautiful exhibit at our local museum on Tortilla Flats. And they said, okay, Punky, what's next? And they were trying to get me to, to write a book. At the time, I didn't feel that confident about it, but you know, here we are, 2016, and I promised uh, one of the elders last year that I would I would do that. So I have a goal to do a story uh, every month. And so far I've been able to, to accomplish my goal. Excellent. So that's, that's one way of passing on mm -hmm. the history. Another way that we, Tortilla Flats Committee, we have um, yearly events, we have reunions, and we bring out our archives, our photos, and um, I'm going to try and be more involved in community uh, events. We just did the picnic for the 150th anniversary, which um, was very well accepted. So those are the kinds of things that, you know, I'm trying to do to, to, to educate um, about our, our, local, our local town. Yeah. Yeah. It's unique. It's very unique. Well, let, let me know the next time you have one of these events. I will. Because I'd like to both participate. Maybe we'll cover it. Thank you. Who knows? To me, it's all about stories. It's all about anecdotal things. It's all about crawling under. I didn't know that houses were built on, uh, up in the air and mm -hmm. you're crawling under through the mud. The image of that says so much about you as, an, as, as a child, about the culture as a child. That's the fun stuff. And so the stories you've shared are wonderful, really terrific. Um, I mean, I've, we could go on forever, but I, are there other things, other stories you want to share about the, about the environment? Because I think we have plenty to make a, at least initial story out. I think the one thing we can't go away with not mentioning is the Green Mill Ballroom. Okay, tell me about the Green Mill Ballroom. The Green Mill Ballroom was located on, I would say, Julian and Main Street, kind of set back. For years, we have not been able to find a picture of the Green Mill Ballroom. You know where Pat Patagonia is at? Sure. Across the street on West Main, right oh. by the Adobe. You know yes. where the Adobe sure. is? That street that goes down? Yeah. Green Mill, Seth, yeah. right there. The Green Mill Ballroom. The Green Mill Ballroom. And it was a place where they would go dance to the big bands, like Glenn Miller and Tommy Dorsey and really? Jimmy Krupa and one of those wonderful swing bands would go there and I just enjoyed hearing stories from my mother and my aunties you know talking about the green mill and they, they were all good dancers and it doesn't matter what family you interview that always comes up the green mill ballroom and it was just such a fun time uh, it, it, you know they went there to have fun and just to forget because it was during the war so it was a, a lot of fun and, and the girls couldn't wear nylons and they would uh, get their little um, eye liners and put a line behind their, their leg, you know, to make believe that they had, you know, nylons. Um, borrowed dresses, you know, because a lot of the girls were poor, and, but they wanted to look nice, so they would help each other and borrow dresses so that they could go dance. Um, so I, I just envision, and, and, and also the bathhouse 
the bathhouse was a nice place for, for some of them to go to as well. They had dances, they had a teen time, they had a swimming pool. I know that one of our cohorts would just look through the window and wish that he could go in because, you know, he couldn't afford to, to go in. But he remembers, he remembers seeing the pool and then later it, it was made into a, a nice, no, a skating rink. Skating rink, yeah. A skating like rink, yeah. yeah. And so I would say like maybe late 40s, early 50s, uh, the teens would, would gather there. Mm -hmm. There was, a, that was a place. And then there was another teen time over by the fairgrounds. Um, that they used to go to and th when the military was set up there they would actually let the kids go on base and play basketball and, and, and volleyball. They would actually set these things up for the kids. So it, all those little stories just you know it was just so colorful and sounded structure. like yeah. Well, In those days there was a moral structure you know honor, respect and chivalry. Very much. You don't see that today. You know, people don't get up when somebody walks in, a lady, or screw their chin. You don't see that anymore. They look at you, what are you doing, you know? But our fathers in those days, you know, they, they had something to keep them home, you know? I mean, when the word got out all the way as far as Los Angeles, you know, or even far north as, as probably San Luis Obispo, you know, that Benny Goodman or Gene Krupp or our local Artie Shaw that lived down in Montecito with Summit Ridge Drive, you know? Uh, when they came to town, everybody would come from out of town, you know, and we had, I mean, it was a, a base of operations for the big bands. And there was never no trouble, you know, and there was no gangs. Not like today, you know, everybody lived in harmony because of that, like I said, those scruples, you know, moral values and, and honor and chivalry, you know. And those guys, they, they got to, well, they had things to keep them occupied, you know, like Golden Gloves boxing and stuff, which our friend Barney Quijada and a lot of the old river rats were a part of. So they were always training out and, you know, working and stuff and keeping busy and maybe, maybe doing some longshoring, longshoring or stuff like that in construction. But yeah, it kept them out of trouble, you know, and uh, they lived well and they loved it. That's why they lived for a ripe old age, you know. And then the baton was passed on to us later in the, in the early, uh, 40s, you know, and 50s, and uh, we did pretty well too, you know, we did pretty well by their standards, you know, but uh, yeah, they made Ventura. They made Ventura. They had a lot of friends all over, you know, they got along with everybody. Yeah, they were deer hunters, you know, after when they were growing up, they were river rats hanging out down at the river bottom, building rafts like we did uh, 20 years later, you know, <clears throat> and hunting uh, uh, musk. Um, uh, rats and I mean not rats. I'm going to say uh, uh, ducks and and, um, and making our own slingshots and stuff down there, hunting rabbits and stuff. You know, and later on when they grew up and got married, I mean, uh, <clears throat> they they took up hunting, deer hunting, most of them. You know, Mama, I could remember when she used to tell my dad. She says, Matt, if you're going down to the river bottom, you bring some cocktails home so I could clean them, and she would. She'd tie them up by the little hind legs up on the apricot tree outside and, and skin them, and that was dinner for the night, you know? And everybody had a victory garden. My grandfather, Bill Elwell, had a big victory garden back there, you know? And I mean, think, things would grow beautifully. He didn't have those uh, modern day, you know, insecticides and stuff. And he'd actually, you know, make uh, bags up and baskets up and hand it out to the neighbors, you know, the people, because we had people that were pretty poor, you know, didn't have a victory garden. But just about everyone had one, you know, you had to, to keep your life going. And yeah. Grandma put it up as canning, she'd can everything, yeah. you know. It's interesting to me because you, you both said that, you know, there were some people who were poor. And I think the perception is from a lot of people <coughs> that you all were, but that's not what I'm hearing. You're, it, was a, it was a good life. It was a good time. And whether you didn't consider yourselves, you were deprived of things. You had all these other things in your community, yeah. in your families. Yeah. It seemed like it was a good time. And we were scolded. We were scolded if you weren't good to your fellow man. You know, that was a going thing. Like Carlos just mentioned, really hobos. Today they call them transates or, or whatever they call them today. Homeless. You know, homeless people. But they had their section down at the hobo jungle. And um, they knew when they'd travel through town and they'd stay there, you know. And we'd run into a lot of them down there at the, at the beach and hobo jungle for clam hunting. 
And uh, my grandfather's backyard, where the, where the garden, the Victory Garden was, it was really big. It went right up to the railroad tracks, but he had one of these sliding gates there. Because across the tracks, when the fair would come along, if you went across, there was this one by 12 slat fence, you know, painted green. And he had one where you could just slide it across and sneak right in, you know. But uh, these uh, so-called hobos, you know, or they would come to grandma's house, you know, and go through that sliding gate and walk through his garden into the other gate and into the back house to the back porch. We had a big porch. And they'd knock on the door and they'd tell grandma, is there any, can I cut you some wood for your stove and stuff like that? She'd tell them, sit down there. And they'd sit out on the, on, on the porch there, you know. And the table was there. She'd put a tablecloth there and salt and pepper. And she'd make a good breakfast from scratch wow. with tortillas like this. Everything, you know. That was pretty common. I've heard yeah. a lot of stories. Yeah, they did that. families yeah. that would serve the, you know, the hobos. Yeah, they did that in those days, yeah. That's yeah. a wonderful story. Yeah, that was beautiful, yeah. That was beautiful. And we learned that, you know. I seen it and I learned it to this day, you know. I see some homeless people out there and I help them out if I can. That's my duty, God-given, you know. It says in the Bible, it says, you know, that man, he says, he says, uh, Lord, he says, when did we do these things for that? And he says, inasmuch as you did it for my friend, you did it for me, you know. So, yeah, I go by that till the day I die, you know, yeah. But that's what the families did in those days, you know, all over. Yeah. The good old days. The good old days. Yeah. Well, that's a good note to end on. <laughs> good old days. Thank you. Thank you very much thank for you. sharing your stories. You're welcome. This is terrific. And um, thank you for joining us for Ventura Legacies. There is so much more to, to look into uh, Tortilla Flats and the history. Um, get a hold of these folks. They can share more because, as you heard, that's their, that's their mission. They want people to know. So thank you. You're thank welcome. you very much. Welcome. You're welcome.